Glad to be in the house of the Lord. <coughs> if you find an uh, iPad with a black case around it, just let me know. Oh, you found it? You're the father. Oh, that's, that's his pad. Yeah, that's his pad. That's, not, that's not iPad, that's his pad. <coughs> but if you buy one, uh, it usually has a black Bible with it that I always, uh, that's my church Bible, as I call it. That's the one that comes with me to church every week, so I don't have to forget mine. And if I leave it here, I still got mine at home. And uh, that some dear friends bought for me. And uh, thanks for that. And so if you find it, just let me know. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, this week, don't forget, uh, tonight is the Hanging the Green service. So if you want to see us get hung, um, come on back tonight. And, and uh, so my family and I, we lined up up here. And they have lunches and things and all. They start to do that every year. Christmas time, they always do that. Just kidding. And, uh, but they, uh, they'll have that. Then Wednesday night, we'll have Bible study at 7. Hope to have all of you here. And um, looking forward to what God's doing. It's been an awesome week. Thank Our Thanksgiving service last Sunday night for me was awful. I don't know about you, but I thought it was awesome. And uh, especially when they ended, uh, the praise band ended with every praise. And uh, I can tell you that all chapters in Rocky, but uh, our praise band was jammed yeah. uh, last Sunday night. Amen. 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 And uh, so we, uh, we're, we're ready to go this morning with them too and appreciate what they do and all too. And I do want to tell you a valuable lesson. This is just for the men in the house, the latest close of years. If you would, uh, men, just remember one thing. It's a lot of times it's always easier to ask forgiveness than men's permission. And uh, somebody told me this morning, asked, asked me this morning that. It's a valuable proverb. Uh, you won't find that in the Bible. That's just a, a, a proverb that, that I'll give you for free this morning. It's always easier to ask forgiveness than men's permission. So just remember that. So. <laughs> Watch this. You hush your mouth. <laughs> somebody didn't ask me about it this morning. won't even dare. So I was like, hey, we're trying to pay. That's awesome. It's easier. Isn't it a lot easier, man? Amen? <laughs> Just uh, don't tell them I said it, because then I'll be shot down. So. But I'm thankful for what God's doing and thankful for <laughs> all of you. Please keep Donnie, Donnie Johnson in your prayers. You go, girl. After my own heart. Now, your brother's after Satan's heart, but you're after my own heart. But that is a true fan, really. That's a true fan. <laughs> that spanking yesterday they got people coming in with that kind of shirt on. Right here, right here. Oh, we got a couple more supporters. A couple more supporters. I, don't, I won't call out the Carolina fans because y'all won't even be able to hear it. So. <laughs> but uh, we're thankful for what, what God's doing. We, uh, we, uh, with Christmas coming up to things, we will be having a, instead of this year, instead of us doing just a, um, helping a, a, a family out or something or doing the, the uh, uh, Operation Christmas Child, uh, as we talked about and I let you know before, um, something I wasn't privy to that just came out this past year is we, uh, the ministry that heads that up, actually the leader of that, um, is salary is about $875,000 a year, just the leader. And so the salary comes from somewhere. So when they tell you that it all goes to the box and all that stuff, and we pay for the boxes, we pay for the shipping, we pay for everything that goes in, I still think that's a great idea that goes to those kids. But I thought we kind of want to see, uh, we kind of want to make sure that it's not going to somebody's pocket too, you know? So we want to get to that, and I talked with uh, the deacons, Lewis told me this morning we got to go for that. Definitely, we're going to take up a love offering throughout the month uh, of, of December to help a family out in need uh, in our community, and uh, that it's really a need, and also to help uh, two little children that are out, help two little children out that are in need also, too. And um, I understand there may be many that are in need, um, but I can tell you this this morning, uh, the two children that were helping out, the, the daddy is in prison, and the mama's not in their life. So... Um, I think they definitely need it. I don't know of anyone in our church that um, that is really the case with them. Um, so I just want to let you know that. Um, and so we can't, of course, can't have everybody out because we may not have the finances too. If we do have enough to come in, we'll do whatever we can do to try to spread, spread the wealth. Amen. And so we want to help this family out that's in struggling and also help out these two children too. Um, also, I want to give you a praise. I shared with those of you that were here last Sunday night, I think it was. I found out that Christopher Little, he's the inmate that I sponsored, and he's, he's a member of our church, and um, and he uh, he was turned out for parole. Y'all know the, the deal with that this year. If you don't know the deal with that, he was turned out for parole again this year. Um, they couldn't answer why. Uh, I was sat there on the, on the um, parole board with him, and I asked the, the parole commissioner, this the six-figure guy sitting in front of me, asking why he makes why why he makes decisions to deploy somebody who was had life plus 30 years, but not somebody who has life and has a much lesser um, felony charge than that. And he couldn't answer me. He said, every case is different. I thought, yeah, you're right. So anyway, it's all political anyway, if you know anything about it. I don't like politics. I hate it. Um, if you, uh, uh, liars have one place to go, and that's in politics. 
A lot of people say, where do they go? Where all liars go? The Bible says, oh, they go to hell, then they go to politics too first. So, um, every one of them, whether you're Democrat or Republican, doesn't make a difference at all whatsoever. Christian is what we all ought to be anyway, and I've seen ones lie on either side of it. So, um, <clears throat> but this week, uh, this past week, I got a call from Christian's dad, and he said that uh, not only was he turned out for parole and he's been in the dumps because of that, um, he was called on the parole commission, was called by the victim's uh, mother and told that he had called them and made harassing phone calls to them from prison. And so um, they said they were going to investigate it. And when they investigated it, they were, the, the superintendent called him in and went off on him and told him they were going to bust him back brown clothes. If you don't know what that is, that's medium custody. He's been in minimum custody level two, almost level three, which is the easiest custody you can get. They took his job away from him in the town, going out every day to work. His sponsor died uh, two weeks ago to take him out of the town. Uh, he was 86 or 7 years old. He used to be the superintendent of the camp. He must not be too bad an inmate if the superintendent of the camp that was retired from the, from the camp for after 30 years takes him out every week to church. You know, he must not be too bad a guy. So anyway, um, the, the, he passed away, so now he had no way of going out. And his dad was all distraught, and his dad said, you know, I just don't know what to do. And I was like, well, we'll pray about it. I mentioned it to you all that were here some night, I think it was. Um, and I got a phone call. I, I uh, thought negatively, just take this as, with a grain of salt for you to learn from, too. I thought, man, they want to investigate this mess. I know. I've been part of the government. I worked in it for years and years and years at the Sheriff's Department and the, and the, and the Fire Department. They, they want to investigate that, really. I mean, they'll just sweep it under the rug. And DOC has a tendency of doing that, sweeping under not really investigate. Well, all of a sudden, my mom texted me the day before yesterday. It says, Friday, it says um, that she talked to Dennis and Chris's dad. <laughs> exonerated him of the charges. Um, and they gave him his job back and everything completely. And uh, all within like a week's time. And what happened was an inmate at the county jail in Gaston accidentally called the wrong number and it just so happened to call the victim's mother. And when she answered the phone, she said she didn't know who it was or whatever. And when it said Gaston County Jail, she just knew that Chris was at Gaston Correctional and so she just thought that that was him that hung up on him and they called the program and turned him in for him. So I said, well, you know, maybe that's a twofold thing. Maybe that, maybe that it helps that they realize that that uh, that they jumped the gun and, and accusing Chris, and maybe they realize just how vindictive the family is. Because my prayer has been for the family the whole time to find forgiveness. Because if you don't forgive people, there's no way you can have peace in your life. There's none. There's no peace when you don't forgive. And, and you know the Bible says that forgiveness from God is conditional for us. And if you don't understand what that means, that simply means this: that Jesus said in the model prayer, "Forgive me of my sins as I forgive others." So if I'm not forgiving you, or if you're not, if I'm not forgiving somebody who's wronged me, then God's not forgiving me. And so I just want to tell you this morning, just to encourage you with that good news that happened this week on Set Friday. And I've, I've never seen anybody here, here work for the state or government or have ever worked for the state or government. Okay, do you, have you ever seen them move that fast? Yeah, me neither. Especially in the week's time. I mean, fully exonerated. Hey, we've already investigated all this stuff. I'm like, man, that is awesome. Because our God is that good. Amen. Amen. Please be in prayer for Donnie Johnson, too. He is still in the hospital. Mr. John, frankly, is doing a lot better. Um, he's, he's still got a kidney stone, but um, not in the same kind of position. As well. And Mr. Donnie had one surgery this week. He said, Pitt, they're downgrading him to, uh, to uh, a, a lower level of care um, for that, too, in the next day or so. So keep him in your prayers, if you would, too. I'm sure you really appreciate it, too. Any birthdays or anniversaries? Well, praise the Lord that you didn't get older this week. Turn around and shake someone's hand this morning. Welcome to this morning. Let's see. Usher's coming. Happy birthday. Let's pray together.
I just prayed about something you never realized. Yeah, that's what I had a place for. That is to be at home with you in heaven. Lord, I just pray for blessing when I'm here. Whatever it might be, whatever the cause it is, it will be, Lord. Bring them back here to your holy time. If it's sickness, bring healing. If it's bereavement, just to be with you, Father. Because that's the word of life. Father, we just thank you for each home and every friend here today. Like your will be your father's all, Lord. Father, we ask that the people of Tyler's and Rangers word. Almighty Father, that the gift of money is that the world knows. And he's bringing what you give him to do for this church, for the community, to watch the world, to let people know you mean business and it's not faith. Father, we ask that the people of Ron this evening come together with the kids today. They lift them up, Lord, and come and trace them. They will help you to understand that they can still have a life. Let it be through your son for what he did for him on the other's cross. Father, we ask you to bless the gift of the devil for whatever we receive. It be for you, my man. Father, get rid of the this day. Bring us back at the appointed time. And whatever be done, on it all be glorified your son. For us in his blessed name, and say that we pray. Amen.
looking at my phone and, and reading uh, uh, commentaries for the scripture. And I'm like, okay, God, where, where are we going with this? And then I realized uh, what he was saying. And, and you know, looking at, uh, he puts characters in our life, he puts characters in the Bible uh, to show us really how to live our life. He puts characters in the Bible to give us examples, not just Jesus, uh, because we know that Jesus was the only perfect man there ever was to walk the face of the earth, right? None of us are perfect. Okay? We want to model our life after Jesus Christ. There's others that came, though, that set examples for us. And when they set examples for us, this is the scripture where we look at this morning. Cornelius sets the example. And he sets the example so good. And as I was studying this, I was like, man, that is awesome. I didn't realize this. And many times as I read the scripture, I didn't think of it this way. He set the example so good that his whole household followed. And I was like, man, he was real. He, he was real. I think today that people are looking for realness. They're not looking for fake, put on makeup, act like act like a, a church person all good all, all, all throughout the Sunday and then act like hell all week long. They're looking for you to be real. They're looking for someone to, to be just as real on Sunday as they are on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. And they want us to be real people to show them the real true God. Because every one of us are falling. Every one of us are sinners. Every one of us fail. Every one of us fall short of the glory of God. But for the cause of Christ, down on the cross, we get eternal life. Man, we've been given everything. We got Christmas coming up, and we think, oh, that's, that's gifts and things. I'll never forget when my little boy was three or four. I went to, pick, went to take him one morning and drop him off. And you always go to daycare. Teacher always like hits you up on your way to work, right? That's Satan, okay? Not the take or two, just Satan just trying to attack me. Okay? <coughs> she might do one of the I don't know. But anyway, we drop them off. And when I drop them off, she comes up to me and she goes, I just wanted you to know that your little boy doesn't even know the meaning of Christmas at all. It takes us all about gifts and getting gifts and everything else and all. And I'm like, what? And I said, no, he doesn't, because he told us that it, it was celebrating Jesus' birthday. Matter of fact, we wanted to make him a birthday cake and all this stuff. I was like, she was like, well, that's not what he told me. I was like, okay. Well, I, I was running late for work, and I was on my way to work, and I was like, all day long, I started thinking about it. I thought to myself, well, I'm not getting down with that lady piece of my mind, for real. <laughs> and I get there to pick him up that afternoon. When I get there to pick him up that afternoon, I walk in, and, and, and she's on the cell phone with all these kids in her classroom. And I'm sitting there going, okay, she tied up my time this morning. Now I'm trying to tie up her time a little bit. Is she going to be on the cell phone? No. Because, see, that's what Satan will do to you. He'll just get in there and he'll start putting that knife in. Just, he'll put just a point in at first, okay? And then he'll start, start getting in a little deeper. And he'll get in a little deeper. Then he'll start stirring in here real good, you know? And then it starts feeling real, 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 real good. And, and, you know, just hits that one nerve, you know? And I walk in, I'm like, okay. Well, then next thing you know, I looked at her and I said, You know, the second hand motions, you know? Y'all got that? We need to talk to them about that phone now. And she comes over and she says, I'll be with you in a minute. I thought, no, you do. Me now. And Satan just keep on. You know? Well, she comes over and, and, and I called Seth. I said, come here, buddy. I said, hey, what does Christmas mean to you, buddy? He said, it's Jesus' birthday, Daddy. I'll never forget as long as I live. Look in the little bitty, little bit eye. I said, what is it? He says, it's Jesus' birthday. And we celebrate Jesus' birthday. He was born of a virgin. And he, he, he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross so that we could all be saved. I looked at her and I said, yeah, he don't know the meaning of Christmas. I really wanted to say some other things and tell her all this other stuff and everything. And I said, I hope you have a Merry Christmas too, though. Come on, buddy. I really did. I just got to be real with you. I'm saying all that to lead up to this. I wanted to say so many other things. And Satan had plugged me all day long to say so many things I'd said in the back of my mind. called, you know, you raise your own kid. You let me raise my kid. You don't tell me what to do with my kid. You raised yours. And I just couldn't. I had a little example there to watch today. And uh, I'm thankful for that, that time. But I want to share with you this morning, our character doesn't speak when we open our mouths. Our character doesn't speak when we, when we talk. Talk is cheap. Our character speaks in our actions. Who we really are is who we are when we're by ourselves. You know, who we are is who we are when we're away from all the rigmarole and all the... That's why I really... God has convicted me that we paint on things at church. You know, we put on masks, you know. We put on our masks when we come to church. We put on our we put on our good makeup and we put on our, our great clothes. And that's why I want it so much to be. I feel like God's calling us to be so much not traditional at all. 
because that's what people fall into. They fall into traditional slumps instead of God honoring and God glorifying. Amazing things can happen in the life of a Christian when they're serving the Lord right. And this is where we're at in this, this story in, in Acts. So go with me this morning. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius who was the captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. Let me ask you a question this morning. You got people in your family that are lost? You got people in your family that, that don't follow God? You got people in your family that never surrendered their life to God? You know, the, the church has made it so much about this and this and this, and you got to do this and you got to do this. You got to dress a certain way, you got to act a certain way, you got to walk down the aisle, you got to say the same little prayer, and everybody else said, that's what salvation is. That's not. Please don't fall for that. <laughs> Please don't sell that poison to your family. It's full surrenders. When Jesus got on the cross at Calvary, he didn't say, okay, Dad, I, I, I give you my hand. He gave his all. And that's what God requires of us. To give him our all. And he knows we're going to fall. He knows we're going to fail. He knew today this day would happen. He knew I would be standing here in front of you today wearing blue jeans and a gray shirt and nothing and be just as the person he wants me to be today as he wants me to be tomorrow. To go through all that I went through in my life to get to the point I am today. And let me to make sure you understand something. I, have, I do not apologize at all for what I went through in my life. Because it made me who I am today in God. I never want to go back to be the, the drunkard and the dope, dope addict and the dope seller and all that. I never want to go back to that lifestyle. But I want to tell you this. God brought me from that so that I can reach out to people who are just as broken as I was. And you know what? Still ain't. But serve a God who pillages his face all together. That's why our families are the way they are. It's because we work this. Don't be upset with me. Be upset with the Word of God, then, and don't be upset at all. Let it change your life. Because that's what it's really convicted me of in these last two weeks of study, thinking, man, gosh, really, Lord? Why do I have lost members in my family? Why does my family say, I thought he was a Christian? You probably got him like I do. I thought he was a Christian. What did he say that for? Why did he act like that? Why was he so judgmental? Chris and I was talking this morning, we're getting ready and stuff, and I said, you know what? People in church take one word out of a song or one word in anything and they make it and judge the whole thing instead of missing the whole message. That's no different than people who take this right here and take one little scripture out and say that being a homosexual is okay. It's no different. It's no different. So now the church has become just like everything else. Let's quit being the judgmental people and let's see the whole message and the whole picture is be real. And know that you're going to fall. And know that you're not perfect. And when people in your life see you as somebody who's perfect, and you've got to be perfect, the moment that you fail will be the moment that they say you weren't real. Be the moment that your family doesn't want a part of what you got. Because you're selling fakeness. But his whole household, everyone in his household was. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Wouldn't that be cool, man? Wouldn't that be cool? You're just sitting there one day, riding in your car, and all of a sudden you hear an angel of God go, Hey! Alex! <coughs> you see the exclamation point over here? He wasn't just saying, Hey, Cornelius. He was getting his attention. He wanted his attention. You see, when God gets your attention... Big things are happening. Amen? Amen. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? Huh. All you teenagers listen to me real good, okay? When God speaks, there's respect. That's what reverence is. It's not sitting in church not going to the bathroom and sit still and not, not whisper and not say anything. In that. It's respect. The same thing you honor your mother and father. Amen, parents? Amen? Amen. Amen. Why do we say yes, sir? Why do we say no, sir? Why do we say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am? Because it's biblical. Amen? Yeah. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts toward the, to the poor have been received by God as a what? As a what? Offering. As a what? Offering. Offering. 
See, when you give to people outside the church, it's an offering. When you give to the church, it's a tithe. Do you understand that? It, it drives me nuts when people make the Bible what they want to make. A tithe is to be given to the local storehouse. It's a tent. It's a decaton. Anything above that that you give outside is an offering. <clears throat> That's scripture. That's what the Word of God has said, isn't it? If you turn to Malachi, it says the tithe should be given to the local house, to the local storehouse. What is the local storehouse? The church. The church. Well, that's why we get tithes and offerings. Well, I grew up all my life in the Southern Baptist Church, staunch Southern Baptist Church, where the old men slept on Sunday morning and, and the young children slept in, in the pew and everything. And, and you, if you said amen or if you raised your hand, people are, you know, something wrong with you, you know? I mean, really, you're a holy roll. You don't do that in this church. You feel free to worship the way you want to, amen? It, it, they, it was an offering. I never knew what a tithe and offering was. I never knew the difference. I never knew and understood until a man of God stood in a pulpit one Sunday and preached several Sundays in a row on what tithing was. And it changed my life forever. And I can tell you that that's why God has blessed me and what He blessed me with. Even, even some of my wants He provides for. Amen? Because you can't out give God. I, I honestly wish, I honestly, and, I, and I'm not above it. If you want to question tithing, I'll be glad to take my checking account. I won't give you the number because of Christmas, all uh, that, that she does. I'll be glad to show you my checking account, show you what's going out and what's come in, and every bill's been met, and God still provides. <laughs> and the first fruits go to Him. And the second fruits go to the outside that's an offering. Because I want that much to be blessed by that big God. Amen? He said it was an offering, it's been received by God as an offering. Now, send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon the tan a tanner who lives near the seashore. They even had taxidermists back in that day. Amen. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout, a, a devout soldier and, his, and one of his personal attendants. You see, it was personal to him. He was given instruction by God. And he wanted it to be personal. He wanted to do something. He wanted to give something of himself. He wanted it to be personal for God. And he told them what had happened. And he sent them off to John. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask over these next few minutes, God, that you would have your will and way. Speak to our hearts this morning, God. We just ask that you would rid our minds of anything, Lord, that shouldn't be there. Anything that would hinder what you want to speak to us today. God, have your will and way this morning. Let people not hear me this morning, Lord God, and my voice. Let them hear you this morning, your voice, because your voice is what's everlasting. God, your voice is all-powerful, and you're all-knowing. And Lord, you know exactly what we need this morning, and I just ask that you provide it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're going to old school this morning. I said, Seth, this morning, I said, well, I can't find my, my iPad. I said, so I had to go old school. Sam said, paper? I said, yeah. We're going old school with the paper this morning. But uh, we know that our God is not a, not a God of, of restrictions. Amen? So this morning I want to say to you as we look at Cornelius, as we just read the scripture, there are, many, there, there are many things that we can learn this morning from Cornelius. Let's look at three today, though, and how they can apply to our lives. First of all, he was a devout man. He was a devout man. The word says he was a, was a, was a devout man. He lived in Caesarea. Okay? Well, this, was a, this was a tough place to live. Because it was, it was named, okay? It was named, oh, you're all right. Don't worry about it, bro. Um, it, was, it was named after Caesar Augustus. He gave it uh, to the Jewish king, Herod, Herod the Great. If you know anything about Scripture, you know anything about the history, this was a tough place to live because of the fact is, this was, who, who was, where was this at? Anybody? <coughs> who lived here? Jew, which? People, Jewish people. Yeah, there you go. Good job. Good, great, great monkey answer back there. And uh, Jewish people did it. Jewish people lived there. So was was he, was Cornelius a Jewish person? No, he was a Gentile. He was living among, and so it's tough. All of us here are Gentiles. I want you to imagine living among people who are not yours, and then trying to serve among people who are not like you. Huh. Kind of sounds like us today, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like Christian. Today. We're serving in a world that just alone, when I went to the Baptist League Commission, there was 6.5 million, I think I said 5.6 for the week, but it's not, 6.5 million people just who claim to not know Jesus Christ and say That's not the ones who, who say they do. Because see, for a long time, I did. For a long time, I thought, well, I walked the aisle when I was eight, 
I said the little prayer, I got dunked, and I mean, I'm good. And I realized that that was all ritualistic, and God wanted all of me. And he wanted all of me and all of my failures and all of my, all of my, all of my faults and all of my imperfections, and he wanted to make them perfect because the day that I surrendered my life to God is the day that I became perfect. I'm still a failure in this world, but as long as I got him, I'm going to live her forever with him, and I'm made perfect in his image. Yes. Amen? Yes. And I will live and dwell with him forever. He lived in a tough place. You and I today live in a tough place. We live in a tough place, in a tough world. Don't believe me? Just turn on the news. Everything we see is negative. We see we live in a, such a negative world. Everything we see is negative. Why do you think it spills over into the church? Why do you think the church has become judgmental? Why do you think they say you got to wear your hair a certain way, you got to dress a certain way, you got to you got to act a certain way, you got to say certain things, and or you're really not a Christian? Why do you think that happens? It's because the world says that, not the Bible. Not the Bible. The Bible says that you are in this world, but you're not of this world. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. I, I, don't, I don't get drunk because I don't want to be drunk with liquor. I want to be drunk in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. That's why I can have a good time and not care what people think and laugh. I didn't care what people thought when they were walking by a Target. I thought I was having a good time. If you don't want to have a good time and you want to act like you're sucking on lemon, it's okay. I want people to know, hey man, this is great. I had more fun today ever as a Christian than I ever had living for the world. And you know what? I wake up the next day and I actually remember it. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Man. <laughs> and I don't have regrets to say, man, I wish I hadn't done that. I did what? I don't remember doing that, but okay, if you say I did, I did. I remember it today. He was a centurion leader of the Italian regiment. A centurion was an officer in the Roman army. A Roman legion was made up of 6,000 men, and it was divided into 10 cohorts of 600 men each. A centurion commanded 100 men each, and there were 60 centurions to each Roman legion. Cornelius was, Cornelius was a responsible man, and he was a leader of men. He led 100 men. Now, I served in the Marine Corps, and, and I was a squad leader, and all I had was 11 men underneath me. And I had some guys that really screw up sometimes. I'll never forget in boot camp, uh, I had a guy in my squad in boot camp, and I guess God knew then that it would start then, but I had a guy that, that, that as a squad leader later on when I got to the fleet, uh, it, this taught me. I woke up at four, 2 o'clock and 2 or 2.30 in the morning <clears throat> by the drill instructor taking my bed sheets and snatching my bottom bed sheet out because you didn't have fitted sheets back then. Okay? You had two flat sheets, and you made it work. You took your flat sheets and you tucked it around. You better be a bounce a quarter off of it. And you took your top one and you, and you, and you tightened it around. And you folded it back. And it had to be just perfect. It had to be three inches. It was the width of your ID card. So if you didn't have an ID card, they would be glad to give you a rock. That was what the drill instructors did in the Marine Corps. They would give you a rock for your ID card because that meant you were stupid as a rock. And so if you couldn't tell what it was. And I, I remember going through there. I remember that, that 2, 30, 2, 2 or 2.30 2 in the morning, you had to watch Firewatch all night long, which meant... Our rifles were hanging on our end of our beds. They were locked up with a cable lock. And our foot lockers were locked. Everything was locked up. But you had these two guys walking fire watch in the middle of the night. And they would take the rifles off and they'd walk in the, around in the squad bay, they called it. They would go in and out of the bunks and things and all. And there was, there was, there was two things this was teaching. One was guard duty. The second thing it was teaching is to watch out for your brothers because there would be people. And we had a guy in our platoon that tried to take his life by drinking air bleach and, and taking uh, ibuprofen, whole bottle of ibuprofen. And so they walked through and make sure that everything was okay. They walked through the head, that's the bathroom, for these civilian people. And walked through the bathroom, and as they walked through the bathroom, they would make sure everything was okay in there. And then they'd come back through. Well, this guy just so happened to be in my opportunity, his name's Gibson. I'd love to see him today. I really would. I just love how he turned out. They had a trophy table sitting outside of the drill instructor's hut where everything that you won went on there, and that was his bragging rights. So when another drill instructor came over to your house and walked in, that's the first thing they look at, your trophy table. And, and our drill instructor, he was like, oh, boys, we're going to be the baddest ones in here. I'm telling you right now. Well, at 2.30 in the morning, I get woke up by taking my bottom sheet and snatching it out from under me. And I get up in my skinny drawers and, and that's T-shirt. And he wakes me up and he says, come here, boy. Because that was a requirement in the Marine Corps. You had to actually talk like a frog. Hey, boy, come here. Let me tell you something right now. First time I ever heard him talk, when they weren't talking like that, I was like, dude, they're fake. That's what Christians are like a lot of times today. And he calls me over and he's like, come here. Look at that trash. 
And I thought, okay, somebody left trash on the floor. And I looked over, and there was Gibson up on top of the trophy table, laying down, asleep. Get out of here now. There was a thing called the sand pit. And it was about as big as from the front of this pew to the back pew, and as wide as the pews are. And that's where they could put a whole platoon in there with sand, wet as it was, and they would dig you, is what it's called. And they would say, push-ups now, sit-ups now, leg lifts now, jump jacks now, south strata hops is what they called it. Push-ups now, sit-ups now, leg lifts now, south strata hops, south strata hops, run in place, run in place, hit the deck, hit the deck. And can you imagine in wet sand what that would get on you with your clothes? Okay, I'm in skinny drawers and a t-shirt. Okay, don't picture that. Picture the sand, okay? All right, wet sand. For 30 minutes. Now, fat people don't like to run, okay? Especially in sand, and especially in your skinny drawers and t-shirt. And then he calls you back inside, and he says, get back inside now, get in the shower. I jumped in the shower, as soon as I turned it on, he said, you're done. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not. You're done. Put my... Camouflage gear on. I had to watch Firewatch the whole rest of the night. And, and every time that guy would close his eyes, I would <laughs> slap him as hard as I could. You ain't going to sleep. If I got to stay up, you got to stay up. Just because of you. My blame was to him because I really didn't understand. I thought it was my job to teach him a lesson. I want to submit something to you this morning. As a leader, we have to realize it's God's job to teach people a lesson. Not ours. We're just to live it out. See, he was a devout man. He was a devout man of God by the way he lived his life, not by what he did. Oh, I can tell you now, honestly, I, I've never forget. We went to combat training afterwards, and I was a squad leader there, and Gibson was in my squad again. And I had stayed home on leave and did recruiting duty. So I just knew he would not be with me again. And I get back to combat, combat training at Camp Geiger down in Jacksonville, and he's in my platoon again. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Really? Really? I mean, just crazy things. And I, I can't even tell you some of the things that he did. Just, I thought, man, a person with a brain that little wouldn't do that. And I would get in trouble for his mess all the time. You know what? That's kind of where we are today. I, I walked in and, and to the Rudy Theater with our seniors. And when I walked in with, to the Rudy Theater with the seniors, I, I would hear people like, oh, well, I thought we were sitting here. Oh, well, our seats should have been somewhere. I can't sit with those. I want to sit here. And I thought to myself, what? And then I heard people say, I heard the ladies coming in and going, ma'am, you can't sit here. And they said, why? And they said, because that's somebody else's seat. Oh! And then they announced, hey, it's, uh, we'll just call it us. It wasn't us, but we'll just call it us and we don't call it another church. It's Charles Church. Woo! I thought, really? you just hateful to that lady. And <laughs> you're going to scream and yell for your church. And I walked out to the, to, the, to the area out front there, the little waiting area and where the refreshment part. And I was talking to one of the ladies, and I said, do we have these seats right here? And she said, you don't, but somebody moved and everything. She said, honey, I said, I'm sorry. I said, you know, we're trying to get church people together. And she started laughing. She said, you know, I had a church actually screw me out of money yesterday and absolutely rob me blind. I said, really? She said, yeah, it was a church group. They didn't want to pay for things. They didn't want to do this. And I, I thought, man, the whole time, that's all I could think about. They shut it. When we got, got up and walked out, I went out and I said, man, can I ask you a question? She said, what? I said, do me a favor, please. Please don't judge all churches and Christians. Please don't judge Christians, by the way, that some idiots ask. And, and I don't mean that disrespectful. I'm just saying, just because they go to church, don't make them a Christian. Just as much as sitting in the driveway, don't make you a car. Right? She said, honey, I don't. We deal with so many all the time. It just made me sick to my stomach to think that this is what the world sees. And we're wondering why our families are lost. We're wondering why our friends are lost. We're wondering why we can't get the message out to people because we're fake. They, they see us as <laughs> on Sunday and they see us act crazy all week long. I'm going to be crazy on Sunday and I'm going to be crazy all week long. Okay, you with me? I'm not going to be any different than I am with you this morning as I'm going to be with you tomorrow. That's what God's called us to be. He was a centurion leader. He wasn't just a, 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 the title alone. He was actually a leader. There's a big difference. That's why God, I believe, with all my heart has called me, as I, as I told Crystal, I'm done with school. Seven years in February I've been going to school. I'm done. I'm so burnt with it. I'm God, I'm finished. I'm done. I'm going to take a break at least for two years from taking a break. And God will take you in a different direction. When you tell God what you're going to do, He'll show you. 
I've been rolling, pre enrolled already for August for my PhD, and it's going to be in leadership. Because something the guy said to me really slapped me in the face. He said, I know a lot of great pastors who love people and who are people people, who want to be with people all the time and love people, want to be active in their lives, and they do great at pastoral care. And they're great theologians, they know their Bible, but they're sorry leaders. I was like, whoa. Because my prayer being, God, I'm thinking about my PhD in leadership. When it comes that time, I know two years when I'm thinking about going to school. And all I could hear in the back of my mind was, don't quit school because if you do, you'll never, get, you'll never continue to finish. And y'all have always heard it, didn't you? If you stop now, you'll never go back. You get caught up in life, a lot of rigor rolls of life, and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, I'm already in the, in the midst of writing papers. I might as well just keep on writing for a little while longer. And then he said, here's the dean of students. Here's the dean of the school of leadership. And he turns around and looks at me and he says, that, that quote to me that I just shared with you, they're poor leaders. And I thought, man, that's what, that's what I need. Okay, my undergrad is in, is in Bible and biblical studies and theology, and my, my, my master's in, is in counseling and pastoral counseling, and I, I feel like the church definitely needs that direction, and, and all, but where's the leadership at? So that's what I'll be doing. I gotta be obedient to God. Because I want to be a leader. I don't want to be a follower of anybody else except for Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. He was a Gentile. You and I today are Gentiles. Living in a lost world, living in a world that is so different than us, or, or so different than what we're supposed to be. You know, I, I was joking with a friend of mine. <clears throat> if, we, if we act silly in church and, and fake enough not to believe this, really, we're crazy. Okay? Do you not think there's people in the Baptist church that drink just like the people in the Methodist church that drink? <coughs> do, we, do we not think that? It's crazy, though. Because we were sitting in a restaurant on Tuesday night, I think it was. We are sitting in a restaurant, and, 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 and this, this family sitting next to me. Lord, please don't let me watch this video, because they might know who it was. But they're, they're sitting next to me, and we're talking their thing, and they're talking about their life and all this stuff. And, they would tell me what they did, and they asked what I did, and I told them, and, and I said, I'm a pastor, and they were like, okay, what church is it? And I was like, uh, Sharpsburg Baptist, and I said, where do y'all go to church? And they were like, so-and-so Baptist, and I was like, oh, okay. And as soon as I said pastor, this one lady takes her beer, okay? Then they had been drinking the whole time we've been there. <laughs> and she takes it, slides it over, and she kind of pours it into a cup, and she couldn't see what it was, and she shuts it back up on the, on the floor. I'm like, are you serious? It was all I could do not to say. They don't worry about that. They don't bother me. <laughs> I'm not your judge. <coughs> I'm not your judge. What I really wanted to say is this. If it affected you that much for me to see you, then it obviously affects you for him to see you. Right. It's not the right or wrong of it. We focus so much in church today on the right or wrong. Nowhere in the Word of God do you find if a man drinks a beer they're going to hell. No. I'm not condoning this one. Nobody here saying, oh, the pastor says, okay, drink. That is a personal conviction between you and God. Nobody can tell you what you're supposed to do. Why don't you seek God about it? But if you're convicted by a man, certainly you're convicted by God. Yeah. Amen? I wanted to say to her, you don't have to impress me, should, for real. It's okay. It's all good. I'm not judging you. I don't, I don't care that you drink that beer. I'm not. Because I see it as the example. Much better than I see it as the right or wrong. You know, people in church will tell you, oh, and it's okay for me to drink, but boy, if I walked out of L&L &L with this 12 pack of beer in my hand, you know what the first thing would be in here on Sunday morning? I'd walk in and people would be like this. But we would preface it in church by doing this. We need to pray for the pastor because he must be going through something really hard because girl, let me tell you what he did. <laughs> See, we preface the gossip with the, with the positive. Oh, let me pray, let's pray for him because let me tell you the gossip about him now. That's all. I'm always really careful when somebody comes up and says, we need to pray for so-and-so and everything. I'm like, Okay. And I'm listening for what's coming next. If it's something legitimate, I'm like, oh, okay, good. If it's something else, I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Keep on getting it. He was a God for your man. He was a God for your man. Even in tough times. See, Caesarea was a city of many different religions and in many opportunities to worship whichever deity a person thought might benefit him or her the most. 
Yes, it was mostly Jewish people, as I said earlier, but it was many religions. If you go to Israel right now and you go to Jerusalem right now, you'll find many different religions. As you walk the Via Della Rosa where Jesus walked carrying his cross, your first step, first place you go, when we went in May, you'll actually walk through the Muslim section. Then you'll go into the to the uh, Greek Orthodox section. Then you'll go into the Catholic section, and the very last section is Christian section. And it's not very big, by the way. That's the sad part. The place is supposed to be God's own place, God's holy people, is just as lost, if not more lost, than we are in the United States. So much religion was going on. There was so many opportunities. Our world is a lot like that today. I mean, people use religion to benefit them the most. I remember when I worked at the sheriff's department, I would start off in a jail, and a, the guys would always turn Muslim when they come to jail. Why? Because they didn't have to eat the same food that the other inmates ate. They got to choose their own trade in. They got to choose their own foods, that, which was not processed meat. It was something else. They didn't have to eat. They, they could get turkey bacon. They could get turkey and this and that because they didn't eat pork. But it's amazing. Boy, you get them back out on the street board and they're coming right out of a ham hot plate. <laughs> it happens. Even in tough times, many people try to find something that will benefit them. And it's totally not what Christianity is all about. It's all about what we can do for God. Amen? Right. Because he's already done everything for us. Yes. That's all Christianity is, really. What can I do for you, God? What can, how can I serve you? How can I do Because you've already done everything for me. I don't need to ask you to do anything. I've I got to be honest with you. He will, he will answer your prayers. Amen? Yeah. He'll answer your prayers. I promise you, if you don't believe me, I will take you back yesterday and walk over half a mile with... I didn't, but two boys did. Walk over half a mile on their hands and knees and everything, tracking the deer. And I, my prayer was, God, please let them find this thing. I don't mean to offend you if you don't like deer hunting and stuff and everything. That's fine. Not, that's not my point here. Please don't judge this the part of the story. Judge this. I'm, I'm praying, God, please let them find it. Please let them find it, Lord. Because, God, I know, I know they're tired. I know this. I mean, man, Lord, it's three hours. Three hours. Hands and knees, briars, stuck all in you. Swamp, falling down in the water, getting scared by a deer. <laughs> Running through like a battle man. And you know what? They found it. And as I'm riding back down the road, I'm sitting there in my own mind thinking, God, you even answer even the littlest things sometimes. Now, I have been sitting in the tree stand before and say, God, please let a big buck walk out today. <laughs> and a big buck not walk out. Let me tell you this, though. It wasn't that God didn't answer my prayer. It was his will be done. Maybe he was trying to teach me patience. And yesterday I was thinking to myself, Lord, you're trying to teach me patience, and Lord, I don't have it right now, so... And then all of a sudden I hear Sam say, well, I'll find him, jump on the back and snap him in the neck. <laughs> and then when he found it, he ran back out of the way and said, tell somebody else to get <laughs> Even in tough times, he prayed to God always. He prayed to God always. You know what? Like I said, I was riding on the road yesterday, and I was riding beside a good friend of mine, and I, but I, I, he didn't hear me. He didn't hear my prayer. You know, the, pr the prayer of a Christian is not the deist of the thou the thou. You know, people tell me a lot of times, I can't pray in front of people. Why? Why? Are you trying to impress the people that you prayed in front of with your eloquent words? Why? Why can't you pray in front of folks? Are you ashamed of God? Because God's word says if you're ashamed of Him before people, then He'll be ashamed of you before His Father. That's what Jesus said. Amen? You don't have to impress anyone. The greatest prayer, I believe, one of the greatest prayers I've ever heard in my life was right here in our church on a Sunday night prayer service that a teenage girl said, Daddy, not, not, oh, Heavenly Father, God Almighty, above. She said, Daddy, I love you. Thank you for just being you and for giving me the things I need. Simple. Simple. I thought when I walked out of the service, I thought, man, Oh, we need to learn. What a profound statement, man. Daddy. You know what? When my children want their daddy, when they're little, what do little children do when they want you to hold them? They hold your arms up. You know what we don't do when we're praising the Lord? We don't hold our arms up. The Bible says, I wish that all men would pray with hands lifted high. Oh, that's Holy Roman. No, that's Bible. That's Bible. Yeah. When I want my daddy to hold me, when God, I just want to be in your presence so much. I just want to feel you. Just wrap your arms around me. I want to reach my hands up to you. I just want to praise you. Because you're worthy of praise. He wants us to pray all the time. 
even in our daily walk, it's just like I'm talking with my best friend because he should be your best friend. He was a God-fearing man and he lived obediently. Okay? The angel of the Lord came to him and said, Cornelius, go to Joppa. Send your people to Joppa. What did he do? Immediately. Immediately. Immediately he called. He didn't wait. He didn't have to say, well, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. God tells us to do things. and People tell me all the time, they're like this, uh, um, well, Pastor, I, um, that tithing thing, let me pray about it. The Bible told you what to do already. Why you got to pray about it? Hey, that witness thing, that, that prayer thing, that reading my Bible, I'm really got to pray about it. You don't have to pray about none of those. The Bible's already told you to. That going to church thing, you know, I, I, I got to pray. No, you don't. The Bible says do not forsake and for gathering together the saints. Amen? Now, I'll tell you why we have service on Sunday and Wednesday night. Why? It's, it's, it's done on purpose. Do you realize that? Because we need a, something during the middle of the week. I don't know about you. But I need something during the middle of the week when I've been facing the world for so long. And I just want to take the world and just kick it right in the teeth and be like, shut up! Because the world sometimes gets in the church too. And I'll tell you, even outside the church, people, church people will say things to you that are, that are not always great. Amen? Every church, you always have a few people that are going to be sorry. You always got a few people that are going to be that are going to be sour. Don't let that ruin you, because you shouldn't be following people anyway. He wasn't following people. Cornelius was following God. God spoke to him through the angel and told him something to do, and immediately he acted upon it. What's God telling you to do this morning? Are you being obedient? Are you, are you being a God-fearing man or woman? Or are you, listen, it's not just for me and this woman. This is for you, ladies. Is God telling you to do something? I love how God speaks. And let me tell you this. Even for us people like me that are really hard-headed, the, the ones that are really, really, really hard-headed and God has to speak to you 10 or 12 times, and then him in here with a brick, and then make them trip and fall before they realize he's trying to tell them something. I'm, like, I'm that way a lot, honestly. I really am that way a lot. Over the school thing it taught me, I watched it last year, last two years in Christmas life when God was calling her to go to the women's ministry and I was the one that was holding it up and, and then, you know, she's got this, this marriage, I mean, this, this women's conference she wants to do that she feels God called her to do. The whole time in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, girl, you got to speak at that women's conference for real. Miss Brooks prayed too many times for boldness for you, for you to be shy. Too many times she prayed for boldness. And people used to tell me sometimes when we'd meet my wife, they'd be like, oh, is your wife stuck up? She don't like me very much, does she? No, she's just quiet. She don't talk because she's married to me. I'll see the trap, right? They don't want to say it. I'll see the trap all the time. <coughs> Amen? Amen? That's why it would be a boring life if she was just like me. Let me tell you something. We'd never get a word in the age wise. We wouldn't even better have good arguments. Because <laughs> neither one of us would ever win. That's not a good argument when you can't win. Amen? You lived obediently. I watched her obedience. And a lady in her church came up to her and said to her, I didn't know anything about it. We were at a conference and all of a sudden it was like, God just spoke to me and said, hey, you need to tell her she needs to be the one to speak. And I looked over and I said, hey, you need to be the one that speaks at that latest conference you're playing on the that you feel like God's calling you to do. You need to be the one to speak at that. And she said, why did you tell me that? I'll never forget as long as I leave. She said, because I got a story? I said, everybody does. She said, you're never going to believe this. She said, at church last week, a lady walked up to me and said, you know what, about this, take, this, lady, this lady's conference and things, and was telling me about it, she said, and you know what, maybe you ought to speak. She said, I thought, no. <laughs> See, we are like in that sense. That's probably the only place we are alike. It's our love for the Lord and our heart in this sometimes towards Him today. Because we, we want to make sure it's God telling us and not man. Because when I follow what man tells me to do, I'm going to fail. That's why when people say, hey, you need to preach on this, you need to preach on that, you need to go through this, you need to have people tell me you need to preach on this study on Wednesday night and Bible study, don't even come to Bible study. I'm like, I can't do that. I can't, I can't do what you tell me to do. I have to do what God tells me to do. If not, I'm going to be punished for it. I have to live obediently. Because finally, he was a giving man. Cornelius was a giving man. To meet the needs of those less fortunate. Do you understand? He gave to the poor. 
We get so caught up in our society today of somebody coming up and needing something and, and, and asking for something, and we're like, oh. Now, now I do believe you got to test it. I do. I do believe you got to try it out and make sure it is because we got to be good stewards with God's money. Amen? We have people knock on our door every week seeking money. I went and opened the door up one day, and this guy's like, hey, man, I'm, I'm coming from, it's always this story, always. Coming from Florida, I'm coming from somewhere down south, trying to get up north, and just have to get stuck here. I'm like, how did you get in Sharpsburg when 95 Highway is way out there? There's many places to stop here. You know, I don't believe any of them stories ever. And the first thing I'm going to do is ask for their ID, because if they won't give you their ID, their not likelihood is on the run, okay? That's the law enforcement and Marine Corps mentality coming back in. And so if they don't give me their ID, I don't even continue the conversation. I'm like, thank you, bless you, we, we hope, wish you the best. But I was sitting there talking to this guy one day, and he's like, oh, we need some gas money, we need this and everything and all. And I was like, sir, we don't have, he's like, just let me get a check or, or cash. I was like, sir, we don't keep any here at the church. We don't keep petty cash here, we don't keep checks here, we don't keep any of that here. And I said, we'll be glad to go with you to get some gas or something too if you need it. I said, but, uh, but hold on a second. I said, where did your car at? They parked around the side of the church so you couldn't see it. I walked in there, it's a brand spanking new Ford F-150 extended cab with a 30-day tag on the back of it. Chrome rims, everything. I said, sir. And then all of a sudden I looked and turned around and he had a pack of cigarettes in his pocket. And I said, sir, I'm not trying to be funny and I'm definitely not judgmental, but if you had the money to buy them cigarettes, you got the money to buy gas and food. He said, oh, you judge me now. I said, no, no, no. I smoked for 17 years, dude. I don't have any right to judge you and I'm not judging you by anything. I can tell you this, as much as I love to smoke and I love it better than people love the Lord probably. <laughs> Not really, but I love it. But if it came down to eating or smoking, I'm going to eat. Amen? I, I, said, I, just wanna, I just have to be real with you. Yes, we have to test it. But you know what, too? We have people come up that we help out, and I hear church people say, well, what if they go do so-and-so with it? What if they take the car back? Well, now we don't, we don't give any cash out ever. We'll go pay for gas at the, at the pump. Or we'll go give them a gift card from Target or give them a gift card from Food Line or give them a gift card from Walmart, somewhere that they can use for food and things. We don't give money out. And I've asked those places. They won't let them take those cards back and get money back. None of those places do. But here's what church people say. Well, what if they take their cards back and get money back and go spend it with somebody? Are we accountable for that? No. We're accountable if we don't do what God's told us to do. He's told us to help the less fortunate. Amen? He's told us to give. He's told us. He was a giving man. And you know what? When you think one minute that it's your money, that's when it's not your money anymore. And it never will be your money anymore because you won't have any. Because everything that I've got comes from Him who pours out His blessings upon me. That's what the Scripture says. Test me, God says. Test me when you give your time. Test me when you write your check out that I will pour out the blessings of heaven on you that you can't even receive so much. I can tell you right by my house. Look at what I drive. Look at what I wear. I'm telling you right now. I'm not wearing this because of health, wealth, and prosperity. I'm wearing it because God gave it to me. And He blesses you. And He will bless you abundantly and continue to pour out upon you when you don't. And when you do, I'm sorry. And when you don't, you won't have it. You won't have it. I, I, I feel as bold, honestly, to say this so many times to people. You give God your first fruit. And if you need a year, if you don't have your bills paid, you come see me and we'll talk. About getting your bills paid. But don't fake it. Be real about it. Because I promise you, in 16 years, January the 2nd of 2000, 16 years ago this January the 2nd, when I surrendered my life to the Lord and I learned what time it was, I started giving God to bless me and 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 bless me, even with some of my wants. Amen? You don't need it. I know God. But I sure do want it. Could I please get it? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Will you tell my wife that same thing? I will. Thank you, God. You're an awesome God. Amen. He did. Experiencing God leads to generosity. See, when you encounter God, so many people want an encounter with God, but they don't want a relationship. Cornelius had a relationship. He had a relationship so much with God that he prayed all the time. He prayed all the time, the Bible says. He prayed every day. All day, every day. When people tell you, hey, I pray for you, they'll tell me this all the time. I love it when people say this. They're like, oh, Pastor, I'm praying for you all the time, every day, all day long. You liar. <laughs> no, you're not. Here's what I tell people so I'm real and I don't lie. Every time I think about it, I'm praying for you. 
Every time I think about it, I'm praying for you. That's really what we do, right? I don't pray for you all day, every day. If not, I couldn't study. I couldn't do anything else because my ADD would kick in. I'd be like, where was I? What was I doing? Every time I think about it, I pray. Every time they cross Cornelius' mind, I pray. You know what? we got brothers and sisters that are hurting. we got family members in the body of Christ that are hurting. we got family members and friends that are lost. And they need somebody to be real. I don't have to be us in the vow and love. I don't have to go out and, and, and I, I love that, that God created the Bible app. Amen? Praise God for Craig Rochelle and LifeChurch.tv. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't follow his ministry or anything about it, but I know he, he, his church created the app. You look at it, it's one of the most widely used apps. Millions and millions of people use it. I don't have to get this out and look at people to be impressed. Be, oh, he's reading this Bible. I can look at it on my phone. Praise God. It's everywhere. We are without excuse for not reading the Word of God. We're without excuse for praying. Because we don't have to, oh, Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you right now. Oh, God. Y'all saw the skit that the youth did. That I think that was so funny. But it's the truth. It's like, no, you got to pray like this. Yo, old boy. No, 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 that's all wrong. Stephen was like, how do I pray then? <coughs> Stephen, I think of Stephen, how do I pray? Didn't you do that one? And they come along, and everybody wants to tell him how to pray. And then finally somebody comes up in the end and says, just talk to him just like you're talking to your friends. Just, just talk to him regularly. Because the Bible says he knows your heart before you ever comes out of your mouth. He knows. He's God. He's the only one that does. You see, that's why in my, my prayer time, when I don't want Satan to ever get involved and get in the mix of anything, I don't never pray out loud for certain things. I pray silently. Because Satan can't hear what I'm thinking. And he can't know my heart. But God does. And God can hear my thoughts. And he knows what is in my heart. And he knows what my desires are. But Satan cannot. Therefore, he cannot hinder that prayer. Amen? And second of all, when, he, when we pray, what separates us from God? A three-letter word. And everybody in the church always looks at these four-letter words. Oh, that's, ter that's terrible. That's horrific. That's horrible. The Bible doesn't even say they're cuss words. It says there's one cuss word, and it's a three-letter word too. It's to take God's name in vain. And the three-letter word is sin separates us from God. See, the Bible's all about the three-letter words. Being wrong. I don't go out of here today and say the pastor condones cussing and everything too, because the Bible says we shouldn't talk like a word, okay? But it doesn't make that word the cuss word. It doesn't make that word the sin. You with me? It's talking like a word is what it makes it the sin. But sin separates us from God. So God convicted me a long time ago in my prayer life that before I ask Him to do anything is to ask for forgiveness of my sin. Because at that very moment, I'm not just forgiven, it's forgotten. You see, friend, I'm human. When you do something to wrong me, I'm like Amos Dress. I was teaching this morning, pretty dress you got on with this elephants on. I was like, you got a girl elephants. Because what are elephants like? Women. And I'm not talking about size, ladies. I'm not talking about size. I'm talking about their memory. They don't forget anything. Fellas, am I right? You can have an argument five years ago, ten years ago, and we done forgot all about it because we just don't even think about that stuff. And five or ten years later, they're coming back and going, you remember what you said to me? No. Yes, you do. I really don't. Yes, you did. You said it to me. When you're, when you're experiencing God, and you're leaving, it leads to generosity, it leads to generosity and forgiveness, and we forget it. We're human, we're never going to forget it, but God always forgets. So when I come before Him to pray, I'm asking and seeking Him, God, thank you, first of all. I want to thank you for everything you've done in my life and everything you're going to do and everything you're doing right now. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, because now my slate is clean and I'm before your throne. There's nothing hindering my prayers right now. There's nothing hindering, nothing breaking the relationship because sin is gone. You've wiped it clean. Now, Father, I'm coming before you to ask you something. I'm asking you to do this. Can I ask you something? He's, asked, he's answering. First thing this morning, I'm seeing God answering prayers already. This morning. I'm seeing God answer prayers in, in our church. I'm seeing God answer prayers in my life. Because he wants us to be 
just like Cornelius. A great example has been given to us as Christians by Cornelius. He was a devout man and a God fearing man. He was a given man. He was a given man. You see, when we become selfish, we're no longer given. And the problem in the church today, and the problem in our homes today, and the problem in our Christian walk today is one word. This is what breaks marriages up. This is what breaks friendships up. This is what breaks families up. It all boils down to self. Not one time, honestly, not one time have I ever done marriage counseling with a couple and not seen selfishness as the root of the problem. Because it becomes a competition. You ever, the greatest competition I've ever been in is not baseball, not football. The greatest competition I've ever been in is with my wife sometimes. When we say, you, you got Ladies and gentlemen, you ever been in this? When, well, I wash the dishes. Well, I clean the bathroom. I did so and so. Well, look what I did. Well, look what I did. I did so and so. It's a competition. It's not a competition. It, it's, that's when it comes about self. And selfishness doesn't lead to giving. It leads to taking. And when all you're doing is taking from the relationship, your relationship will fall and it will ruin. God wants you to give. Oh, oh, he's talking about money. No, I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about everything about you. I'm talking about all of you. Give all you got to God. Give all you got to your family. Give all you got to people. Because when it's yours, you're selfish. And God wants us, me and you, to stop being selfish. He wants us to love like there's no love. I met a man this weekend, and God just convicted me and said, Hey, love on that guy. Love on him. He just needs somebody to love him. Love you know, I'm telling you something honestly. I'm a man, hardcore Marine, baby, and I'm still there. And I don't fault not one bit for looking a man in the eyes and saying, Hey, man, I love you, bro. See, I'm married to a super smoking hot wife. God bless you with that, too. If he hasn't yet, pray for it. He'll give it to you. I'm comfortable in mine. And Jesus said to love. Love your neighbor, love your brother as yourself. That's why I don't, I don't have no fault with people. I, I, I think sometimes when people hear me say to another guy, hey, I love you, brother, did you just tell you love him? <laughs> I accidentally told my captain that one day on the, on the telephone because I was so involved in the conversation and everything. We were at the fire department. I was talking, I was talking to Crystal. So, just, so as you get in the emotion of things, sometimes I get out in the, in the, what is that word I'm looking for? Routine. Looking at routine things, I'm like, okay, all right, love you, baby, bye. My captain called me back and said, did you just say I love you, babe, to me? <laughs> God wants us to be real. And he wants us to be given. Because truthfully, <laughs> Cornelius realized what we all must realize is that our character speaks in our actions. Not in our words, in our actions. This morning I want to ask you something this morning. As the praise man sings and leads us this morning in our offer to offer time to the Lord this morning. You know, many people call it altar call. Many people call it whatever they want to call it. I just want to say this is the ministry time this morning for the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Whatever God's laid in your heart this morning. Right there in your seat, the altar's open for you. If you want to pray with that, people will be glad to pray with you. And if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, is there something I can pray with you about? They're not trying to be those in your business. They just want to pray with you over there. If you don't want to tell them, you don't have to tell them. If they put their hand on your back and just pray over you, just be thankful that somebody cares enough to pray with you. Amen? not trying to be in your business. They love you. That's out of love. I want to tell you this one. I love every single one of you. And I'm thankful for you. More than I've ever done. I want our characters at church to speak in our actions towards other people. Not just on Sunday morning. But when we live it out throughout the week. And people to know we're real. People to know where we fall. People to know we fall short. People to know we sin. People to know that we're broken. But we serve a God who gets it all together. He's the glory of that man. She's great to your feet this morning. God's been giving your heart to something. Right in your seat, right at the top.